What I thought of was this, that anything that transpires from this moment onward for the rest of this conference will merely be footnotes to the two messages we've heard already. Uh, I'm speaking this morning or this afternoon after hearing these first two messages uh, in something of a state of shock. Uh, something of a state of conviction, because uh, we have tried very hard at St. Andrews uh, to resist the temptation to the trendiness of contemporary worship and to examine everything that we do very carefully to make sure that our worship service is structured according to a way that is pleasing to God. And where I lose sleep is not that we're too grave or too formal, but I'm afraid that we're not formal enough. And I've been sobered by listening to, again, the call of the Word of God to worship God in the way that He requires, in the way that He commands. And I think that each one of us, and particularly those of us who are in positions of ministry, that we need to be on our face before God, turning the guns of criticism on ourselves all the time on a regular basis saying, is this what the Lord wants? Now, by way of footnote, when I heard Doug start speaking so eloquently from Hebrews 12, I said, well, there goes my message, (laughs) because my basic text this afternoon is the very text that he spent so much time expounding. But since it's the Word of God, I believe it bears repetition. So let's look at it from a little different perspective, chapter 12 of Hebrews, beginning at verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now, let's just stop here for a second before we go on with the rest of the text. The author of Hebrews is telling us here what New Testament worship is not. We don't come to that mountain where God required the people of Israel to come before He would give to Moses the Decalogue. Everybody knows what's in Exodus 20 in the Old Testament, the record of the Ten Commandments. But rarely do we look carefully at Exodus 19, which was the setting for the original context of the giving of those commandments where God descended to His holy mountain and called the mediator of the Old Covenant, Moses, to come up into the cloud and speak to Him face to face. But before this takes place, God commands Moses to instruct the people to set boundaries around the base of Mount Sinai that they are not to transgress, and if anyone steps over the line, touches the mountain, they are to be executed, 
If one of their beasts of burden wanders into the mountain, it is to be shot by the arrow or killed. And in fact, the people are not even allowed to come to the base of the mountain until first they go through three days of extensive purification. Listen to this, in which they were required before they came to the base of the mountain to wash their clothes. Does God care how we dress when we come near to Him? Are flip-flops and shorts okay? You would have dropped dead in that kind of outfit at Sinai. So that this meeting between the people of God and their God was anything but a casual event. Anything but a cavalier moment in their history. And so after elaborate cleansing and purification and preparation, God comes down with fire and lightning and with clouds. And again, as it is recalled here by the author of Hebrews, the mountain burned with fire and was marked by blackness and darkness and tempest. And he says, that's not where we go to worship. We don't come before God in the tempest or in the blackness or in the darkness. But the first question with respect to worship that I want to address, which has already been mentioned by both of our speakers, is the question of the locus of corporate worship. Where do we worship God? And here is where we read the text. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels and of the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, is that better? There are few of us, if any, who believe what I just read from the Word of God. I mean, do we really think that when we come together for worship that we actually ascend into heaven? I was speaking at a church locally here a few years ago, and they had gone from one service to two services, and it didn't work out very well because they would have about 800 people at the second service and about 35 at the first service. But I came to the first service, and I looked at this great big room, and there were only 35 people there, and I said, I hope you'll excuse me if I sound or seem to be nervous this morning but I really get intimidated whenever I'm called upon to speak before such a huge crowd. And everybody laughed. And I said, I'm not kidding. Do you realize the size of this congregation? And they looked at me like they wondered what I'd been smoking. And I read this passage to them and I said, do you understand that when we come into church on Sunday morning, we walk over a threshold. We make a transition, not only from the profane to the holy, from the secular to the sacred, from the common to the uncommon, but from the earthly to the heavenly. 
that if you are in Jesus Christ and if Christ is in you, then you enjoy a mystical union with him and with all other people who also are in him. And that doesn't just mean the people in our local congregation, but it means with the church of all ages. Is this thing still on? Can you hear me? They took my whiteboard and put it all the way back here. Who can see this thing back here? You can't see that thing up there. How am I going to use this? Watch, I'll fall all over myself. Hey, this actually can be moved. We got to get the Latin out of the way. If you're familiar with the Apostles' Creed, you say the words, I believe in the communion of saints. The communio sanctorum. What does that mean? There's the word unio from which we get the idea of union or oneness. One of the reasons why the early church in confessing their doctrine of the church said that the church is one. It's holy, it's Catholic, it's apostolic, but it is one. And the prefix com means with. And so there is a profound unity that takes place in corporate worship where one Christian is united with every other Christian who is there. And it is the community or the communion of those who are the holy ones. I am all for evangelistic outreach services. I think it's great to have midweek services of outreach or special evangelistic crusades. But corporate worship is for the saints in the presence of God. It is to be designed for the fellowship of the saints. So we see, first of all, that the locus of worship is heaven, not earth. And who are the participants of this worship? The author of Hebrews says, we have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company, a countless number of angels. What was the attendance this morning? Huh? Yeah. Myriads and myriads and myriads of angels. And what were those angels doing? The angels were joining in the heavenly choir, joining with the seraphim, singing in antiphonal response, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. I mean, we're in that choir. <laughs> I'm always trying to get more choir members at our church in St. Andrews. And then there's one of these days I'm going to hear a voice from heaven where God's going to say, what's the matter? Isn't the choir that I've provided for you sufficient? We're there in the company of the angels. But you see, we can't see them. Those people in the Old Testament could see that smoke and they could see that lightning. They could see that mountain. But we go into the heavenly holy of holies, which right now remains invisible to us. We can't hear the angels singing, but they're there. They're participants in this experience. I know that they don't know most of the songs that we're singing. I don't think they care to hear, know them. But in any case, to the General Assembly, I know this is not a Presbyterian General Assembly, 
but it's to the General Assembly and the Church of the Firstborn. Who is the firstborn of all creation? Who is the firstborn from the dead? Who has gathered for himself a people who are his? What church do you belong to? I belong to the church of the firstborn. And we worship every Sunday with the congregation of the firstborn. To those who belong to Christ, who are his church in heaven. To God, the judge of all. Before I had the greatest honor of my life and most unspeakable privilege of being the pastor of a church, and instead had the simple task of being a teacher, proving the ancient adage that those who can do and those who can't teach. I would move from church to church, place to place, and sit in the congregation. And Often I would find that I would be sitting in the congregation and the minister was a former student of mine. And they would gulp when they see me come in. and They'd come up and greet me before the service, but their hands would be shaking and they were saying, oh, I didn't know you were going to be here this morning. You know, I'm, I'm, I wish I were better prepared. And on and on about how intimidated they were because I was going to be in their congregation. I said, does that bother you? And they said, yeah. I said, you have to preach before Almighty God every Sunday morning. Why should I bother you? <laughs> but the other Hebrew said, we come into the heavenly city, into the heavenly uh, tabernacle where we have the firstborn, where we have the innumerable companies of angels, and where God himself is present. Who else? The spirits of just men made perfect. One of the things I hear all the time and when I speak here and about, about worship with my friends who disagree strongly with my views of worship, and we'll talk about it, and I say, R.C., we've got to be able to reach Generation X they, the old music doesn't cut it. They don't like it. I say, they don't know it. And I say, can you imagine designing worship for one generation of people? One of the great things about hymnody in church history and the great liturgies of the past is that they reach across the centuries, they reach across classes, they reach across age groups. You know, the church was not invented for teenagers. The whole corporation, the whole corporate body, when I mean, it was wonderful to hear that story that, that uh, you gave about the because of two-year-olds raising their hand. In our church, every Sunday morning, we sing the Sanctus. You know, after singing it every Sunday, Sunday in, Sunday out, uh, do I get tired of hearing the Sanctus? I get tired of the song. I get upset with the Sanctus, I have to admit it. It kills me. Every week we sing it when it's over. I could stand up there and sing the Sanctus over and over and over and over and over and just let myself float into the heavenlies singing the Sanctus. And we do have, this is one of the things I sweat about, we do have the little children who don't sit through worship the whole time, and I have to look at that, but they do come in, the nursery ladies, bring the kids in the side door, the little ones, for the Sanctus. And they'll never forget the Sanctus because it is so rich and so full and that it touches over the centuries the communion of saints and it is appreciated by those in attendance on Sunday morning who are the spirits of just men made perfect. If 
finally, finally with respect to this point, not finally with respect to the mess. <laughs> to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks, speaks better things than that of Abel. We come into the presence of Christ. I know that I have a friend in Jesus, and He invites us to call Him friends. And I know that because we are justified, we have peace with God and we have access into His presence. And I know that we are invited to come boldly into His presence. But that invitation to come boldly is never an invitation to come arrogantly. And there is no Christian in this room who, if the Lord Jesus Christ walked in that door right now and walked across in front of you, would walk up to Him and say, hey, Jesus great to see you, buddy. Nobody would do that. You would be on your faces, and you know you'd be on your faces. Well, that's who you're going to see on Sunday morning. You're coming into His presence, into the presence of God, into the presence of the angels, and then you have to ask yourself the question, what is appropriate? What kind of behavior is appropriate? What kind of activity is appropriate if you enter into the heavenly holy of holies? Now, he makes another statement here at the very end of this text that I don't want to just miss. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks, that speaks better things than that of Abel. Wow. New covenant worship beats Abel. In the middle of the 20th century, an important book on the church, on ecclesiology, was written by a Roman Catholic the the theologian by the name of Eves Conger. Professor Conger wrote this book called Ecclesium Ab Abel. The church from Abel, in which he said the church in terms of a group of people involved in corporate worship really began with Abel. And he had in view the text that closely precedes what I've just read in chapter 12, where we look back at the roll call of the heroes of faith in chapter 11, where we read in verse 4 of chapter 11, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. To refresh your memory of that, Let me read these words from Genesis chapter 4. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Stop right there. Brothers, different livelihoods. One's a farmer, the other one's a herdsman. One brings from his livestock, the other from his produce. One gives his offering. God respects it. God accepts it. God delights in it. God is pleased by it. The other brother subjects his offering, and God has no respect for it. God rejects it, and He is not pleased by it. 
Now, before we ask why God accepts the offering of Abel and rejects the offering of Cain, let us see the first thing that we learn from this text. The first thing we learn from this text is that God does not accept all forms of worship that are offered to Him, and we need to know that. That's a scary thought, because what if your worship is not acceptable to Him? What if your worship is offensive to Him? What if my worship is displeasing to Him? Well, let me answer that question. That's not just a rhetorical question. Ladies and gentlemen, if my worship is displeasing to Him, then I've got to change my worship. And I've got to find out what kind of worship is pleasing to Him. Now, the facile answer to the question that I hear again and again from people as to why it is that God accepts uh, Abel's offering but doesn't accept Cain's offering is the idea this, well, obviously it's because Abel's offering was a blood sacrifice and Cain's wasn't. And so what do you say to that? What do I say to that? So what? Is there some principle in the Old Testament that the only kind of sacrifice that is acceptable to God is one that involves blood? Did not God Himself institute cereal offerings and grain offerings in Israel that were completely delightful to Him? I don't think that we can get to the root of this question by looking at what was offered on the altar. And when we get to the book of Hebrews, it doesn't say by faith. Abel offered a blood offering and Cain offered a non-bloody offering, no. The difference was one was a sacrifice of the praise to God that was offered in faith. And the other was not in faith. Again, as we've heard over and over already this afternoon, we are to worship God in spirit and in truth, and God seeks such to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Obviously, beloved, there was something wrong with the spirit of Cain's offering that made it unacceptable to God. His was not a loyal, faithful response of worship. Obviously, Cain's act was centered on Cain and not on God. To worship God in spirit is to worship from the deepest chambers of our soul, from our heart, not from the flesh, not from the surface, not through simple rote. I mean, obviously, as has been said already, traditional worship can be as repugnant to God as other forms of worship if it is not offered in spirit. The people of Israel went through the forms, they went through the liturgy, and as Jeremiah said to them, you people come to the temple, you do the right things, you sing the right songs, you follow the right liturgy, and you say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and you say it until the cows come home, but you trust in lying words because your heart's not there. But what if you have really zealous worship it just sort of misses the truth a little bit. Well, in all of Scripture, the record that we have of the most zealous worship ever brought before God by the people of Israel, the best attended worship service ever, where the singing was with the greatest gusto ever recorded in sacred Scripture, where for the first time Israel had an authentic mega church. 
was while Moses was up on the mountain and the people were dancing around a golden calf. A calf which led to their being poisoned by that very artifact. They choked to death on their sin. There was zeal, there was numbers, there was excitement, but there was no truth. It was false worship. That's why this is such serious business, that we be careful that what we do in the presence of God, in the presence of angels, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ is according to spirit and according to truth. Now, somebody made mention to the, the, the uh, idea of the worship wars of our day. And I guess it is a war. There's a lot of rhetoric, a lot of anger, a lot of heat. But I think for the most part, we've, we've heard that the battle's over because the church has been completely conquered by the new models of worship, seeker-sensitive worship, and that that's the order of the day, and so there's no reason to be concerned anymore. And that those of us who haven't followed along are the dinosaurs who were rapidly passing out of existence. I wonder how much hostility there really is when people differ over worship style and worship theory. I guess these issues can be pretty serious. When you stop and think that the first record that we have in sacred Scripture of homicide, which actually was fratricide, took place when one human being murdered another human being because he was angry that the one other person, his brother's worship was acceptable to God and his wasn't. And when we see that, beloved, we have to ask ourselves with as much honesty and integrity as we can muster, is my worship of God the worship of Abel or the worship of Cain? because there is a difference. Now, the model of worship that we find in the heavenlies, we've looked at the locus of worship, we've looked at the participants, we've looked at the demeanor in terms of faith, and now I want to look briefly at the the depth dimension of worship which is found in the word Gloria. I very much agree with the observation that our church has fallen back to a theologia Gloria rather than a theologia crucis, a theology of glory rather than a theology of the cross. However, when we come together to worship the living God, we are coming there to ascribe to Him glory. One of the solas of the Reformation, sola Deo gloria, to God alone the glory. And I'd like to take just a few moments to see what this means. That the word glory in English comes from the Latin gloria, which translates the Greek doxe, which takes us back to the Hebrew kavod or kavod, 
And when we look at that concept of the glory of God in the Old Testament, his kavod, the Semitic roots of that word mean weightiness or heaviness. That's interesting, isn't it? That God's glory describes His weightiness. Now, obviously, it doesn't describe His weightiness in crass physical terms. It's not like God is Buddha who's obese and huge in His physical size. But rather, the idea of kavod speaks of the weightiness of God's dignity, of His majesty, of His holiness. And we use that word weighty or heavy in the same metaphorical manner in our own culture today. If we hear a speaker say something that we think is particularly deep or particularly profound, we might say, whew, heavy. That's heavy stuff. And if somebody ignores us or deals with us in a superficial way, we say they took us lightly. That's another barometer that we should use for our worship. Is our worship light or is it weighty? Is the one we're worshiping light or weighty? You know, I have no brief against contemporary music. Please trust me on that. I've written hymns myself, and since I'm still alive, they could be called contemporary to some degree. And even though Jim Boyce has gone to be with the Lord, his hymns, which are very rich, are still part of the contemporary music scene. I don't think there's anything wrong with being new in music. Every song that we hold dear in the life and the tradition of the church was new at one time. It wasn't like the, the uh, Benedictus was composed and then the church waited four centuries before they sang it. No, the problem is not the difference between old music and new music, it's between good music and bad music. Between music of substance and music that is frivolous, that is so light, it may be entertaining for a moment, but sooner or later people say, is there nothing more? And let me say something else at this point. If we carry the gospel into a remote part of the rainforest of South America and we come to a primitive tribe of people, or in Africa or wherever, and we begin to teach them the things of God and we gather together for worship, is there anything wrong with singing Kumbaya? No, there's nothing wrong with that. But after these people have gone through instruction on the things of God year after year after year after year, there comes a time when you get beyond kumbaya, or else you're still in the elemental stages. You're still in the place of milk, which the New Testament tells us don't ever be satisfied with that. When I was in seminary, the homiletics professor said, if you become a, a, a preacher in a church where the congregation is college educated. Remember, don't ever preach above an eighth grade level or you'll lose your congregation. And I said then, I said, that's just simply not acceptable. I have people in my church come up to me now, and they say, oh, I say, you use words that I've never heard before. I say, isn't that great? <laughs> you come often enough, pretty soon they're going to be part of your vocabulary. <laughs> and maybe you'll begin to think about justification 
and propitiation. But we insist on remaining babes in the things of God. And we're not allowed to do that. No. The great Augustine, when he talked about the experience of worship and the experience of music in worship, he used a word. Oh, I said I had to get, I didn't get done with the Latin. <laughs> Can I have one more? Thank you very much. You'll understand immediately what English word comes from this. Gravitas. Gravy, right? <laughs> Our worship should be like gravy. No. He said that worship should be marked by a certain gravity. Not the law of gravity where we all fall down. That's not what he's talking about but a gravity, again, that resounds with this concept of the weightiness of the one whom we are worshiping. When I come into the presence of God, I come with a solemnity born of reverence and of adoration. I once read the story of Babe Ruth when he visited Europe, traveled to England, and was invited to meet the king. But before his audience with the king, the Sultan of Swat was instructed in court etiquette on the proper protocol for how one addresses a monarch. And they told him how he was to give obeisance and show respect to the King of England. And they went, rehearsed it, and taught it to Babe Ruth. And they said, do you get it? And he said, yes, I understand it. So finally, the doors to Buckingham Palace were opened. And the official came out and greeted Babe Ruth and escorted him into the presence of the king. And as soon as Babe Ruth saw the king, he walked in and he said, hi, king, how you doing? See, only an American would do that in the presence of a king. See, he felt no sense of gravity, no sense of majesty, no awareness of the augustness, at least of the office of a king. In a word, beloved, he treated the king lightly rather than with glory. Again, this gravity is not a gravity of severity. It doesn't mean that worship is to be severe, or that the only way in which we can please God is if we come into His presence as sour pusses. That's not the idea. But again, it is coming in the posture of honor. I mean, we wouldn't even have to talk about this, as I said a few moments ago, if Christ Himself came in, or if God right now, who is an all-consuming fire, would manifest Himself to you in a theophany, this moment, we'd stop talking about what is the proper way to enter into His presence. And so to put it simply, there are only two things that people have to remember when they come to church on Sunday morning, when they come in with the corporate people, with the communion of saints, when you come to worship God, there are only two things you have to remember. Who God is and who you are. 
if we keep those things straight, that our worship is theocentric, not anthropocentric, if we come into church on Sunday morning and we're fixed on the one whom we have come to praise and offer the sacrifice of praise and realize who God is, and we know who I, who we are when we come into His presence, that will define our behavior. Twenty-five years ago, I met with a young man who had a vision for reaching the loss. And he took a, a survey of thousands of people in the metropolitan area of the city where he lived. Talked to thousands of people who at one time had been church members and who dropped out of their churches, and he asked them, why did you leave the church? And he said the number one reason people gave for leaving the church was that because church was boring. And the second most frequently given reason was that church was irrelevant. He said, so I understood that if I'm going to reach this generation of people for Christ, if I'm going to reach these people who are lost and dying, we've got to rethink church altogether. We've got to revolutionize church. We've got to change how church looks. We've got to change how church functions. We have to change how the music is. He said, because I'm going to make sure that nobody who comes to my church will be bored and no one will ever walk out of here and say it was irrelevant. And that man single-handedly revolutionized American worship and built the fastest, biggest, growing church in our day. And when we talked about this 25 years ago, I said to him, you know, I look in the Old Testament and I see all kinds of records of people encountering God. And their subjective reactions differ one from another. Some people, when they come into the presence of God in the pages of Scripture, they cry. Some people pass out. Some people leap for joy. Some people are stricken with silence. Some people tremble in fear. I said, but I've never found anywhere in Scripture where somebody encounters the living God and is bored. Ever. It's a human impossibility. Nor do you ever find anybody in Scripture who encounters the living God and yawns, walks away, and said, Phew. not much to that. It was irrelevant. I said, the way in which you reach out to people who are lost about the living God is not by hiding the living God from them. But if you want a worship service that is alive and exciting and interesting and relevant, then do everything in your power to make sure that the character of the living God is made known in that worship service. Finally, just a piggyback on what was said before me. Gene Edward Veith, in his book on literature, makes an interesting distinction and I'd never heard of before when he talks about the postmodern American. He said that historically, we've divided people into two groups, the literate and the illiterate. Those that could read and write, those who can't. He said, but that won't do anymore. These categories are insufficient to really describe the culture in which we live. And he said, there's a third category in addition to the literate and the illiterate, and it is the ah-literate, or the a-literate. And Ed Veith means by that that there are tens of thousands of people in our culture today who are literate in the sense that they can read and they can write, but they're all literate in the sense that they're not interested in reading and they're not interested in learning through that means. 
They want to learn through sense impressions, through sound bites, through uh, the kinds of things that uh, Sinclair was spelling out just a few moments ago. What are you? I read recently that in a given year in the United States of America, only four people ever, four people out of a hundred, ever walk into a bookstore and buy a book, not to mention the kind of books they're buying, but just buy any kind of a book, only four people out of a hundred. We are no longer a reading people, and isn't that strange when the way in which God has chosen to nurture us and to bring us to fullness of Christ is through His Word. And we are called to be the people of the Word. Look at your church architecture. What does it say? I go into churches all over the place in this day and age. And you know what I see in the center? Well, it's not even a chancel anymore, it's a stage. That speaks volumes. But on the stage is a plexiglass, translucent and transparent, little plastic uh, podium that's portable. You can pick it up and move it. Now, I'm sure that there are preachers all over America today who are preaching sound messages behind those portable pulpits. But that change in architecture cha signals a change in what is important to church. And so I ask the question, when the pulpit disappears from the sanctuary, can the sermon and the preaching of the Word of God be far behind. Christian people think, think what's happening. Ask yourselves, is this improvement? Is this advance? Or is this retreat? Because what we're concerned about is not our comfort but the glory of the living God. Let's pray. Father, we don't always know if what we're doing is pleasing to You. We don't always search Your Word and use that as the norm by which we accept or reject our experiments, but, oh God, protect us from offering strange fire on the holy altar, and protect us from trivializing Your weightiness, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Before I leave here, I just want to say one of the best books I've ever read on this issue, on this debate of worship, is a little book entitled Gospel Worship by the Puritan Jeremy Burroughs that we have down across the hall and at the Sola de Gloria section there. That book, you know, really caused me to stop dead in my